afternoon and welcome back to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. We're going to start with the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Some scheduling announcements and updates. So for the month of uh, February, our schedule will be, will be posted tomorrow on our website. So I'd encourage folks to check out our press release on our uh, calendar page. And just as a preview for next Wednesday, February 3rd, the board will be hearing from our partners at DIVA on the Qualified Health Plan Standard Plan Designs. So just like that, the rate review season is starting. <laughs> That's all I have to report. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, the next item on the agenda are the minutes from last week's meeting. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the minutes were approved unanimously. So next I'm going to turn over the meeting to Michelle Degree to introduce um, the team from Mathematica. Michelle. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so today on uh, our agenda is a discussion on the pair differential reporting as required uh, of the all pair model agreement, uh, section 10, if I'm remembering correctly, although it's not right in front of me. Um, and so today we're going to talk about three of those reports, uh, the annual report, the pair differential assessment report, and the pair differential options report. Um, as Chair Mullen noted, uh, we worked uh, with Mathematica Policy Research on this work, um, and they're here to uh, walk us through that today. Um, and I believe with me, I, I saw Shule log on. Um, I believe we're also expecting Vincent and Carrie Ann from their team. Um, this work was conducted sort of throughout the summer, um, dealing with quite a few data delays, as we're all aware of, uh, that have been happening as a result of the public health emergency. Um, and we worked closely with the Agency of Human Services and DIVA on uh, the production of this report. So with that, um, Shule, if you are able, you're welcome to share your screen. I do have the slides on deck if you need me to handle that for you. Uh, but with that, I will turn it over to the Mathematica team. Shula, you may be muted if you're speaking. Can you hear me okay now? Yes. <laughs> Double muted as usual. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present the uh, uh, presentations on the three reports. Um, before I get to it, I wanted to acknowledge and thank um, the team. Carrie Ann and Winston Paul work with me on this report, as well as On Point Health Data, who is our subcontractor, provided the data that we needed on the APCD. Um, in addition to DIVA, um, commercial payers also created and provided us valuable information um, to get to a stage where we feel confident um, with the results of the report. Um, in addition to Michelle, Sarah Lindbergh, Alina Derube from the staff, um, uh, appreciate their feedback as well. Um, so this is really a, a big and important project for us um, and a very complicated topic as you're going to see um, in, in a minute. Um, so with that, I'm going to share my screen. So I do have two screens. I want to make sure I have the right one before we get to it. Um, no, actually, all right, let's see. Okay, um, do you see the slide deck? Yes. All right, now if I do the presentation mode, um, I think you are seeing both of the slides. So I'm going to make the next slide smaller. Is this a good size for you all? Yes. All right. As Michelle mentioned, we have three reports. Um, so at the end of uh, 2020, we were able to complete all these three reports. So we have a, a thorough picture of the payer differential. Um, the agreement specifies that we focus on all payer ACO benchmarks in all these two 
three reports. So one thing to note is that we are really looking at the ACO benchmarks and the differences between payers who have contracts with the ACO. So it will be the commercial Medicaid and Medicare ACO benchmark analysis in all these three reports. Um, we changed the order of the presentation a little bit um, and we wanted to start with the assessment report and then we'll look at the annual change report and then finally I will summarize the options report. Um, we spend a lot of time on the assessment report um, developing the methods so we have apples to apples comparison between a a ACO benchmarks um, and that kind of triggered down to annual um, change report um, as well as informed our considerations for the options um, in the third report. Moving forward, um, we are obligated to report the annual change to CMMI, so that's going to be an ongoing reporting um, that we would do, but the methods will remain the same um, as we reproduce the change over time um, for the annual report updates for the CMMI. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to the methods for the assessment report. Um, so as you all know, um, we have differences in uh, ACO benchmarks and the first step is thinking through what the ACO benchmark rate is going to be. So for the payer differential, we picked Medicare as our reference. So in this slide, what you are seeing is the denominators as we are looking at the payer differential is the Medicare fee-for-service ACO benchmark rate. Um, so what we compared in these reports is what we call payer differential. Um, so that would take the Medicaid ACO benchmark rate compared to the Medicare fee-for-service ACO benchmark rate. And for commercial, the same math applied. Uh, so we are comparing the commercial ACO benchmark rate to the Medicare fee-for-service ACO benchmark rate. Um, as we went to the next stage, um, we needed to align the way the ACO benchmarks were calculated. Um, um, so in, in this case for the Medicare fee for service, um, the benchmarks are set on paid amounts. Um, so the benchmark numbers uh, that we received from uh, the commission is excluding the, the co-pay and co-insurance that is on the patient side. Um, conversely, on the Medicaid, as you all know, Medicaid do not have coinsurance and copay, so we had to make a decision on how we are going to compare uh, the Medicare and the Medicaid benchmarks. Um, even though both of them are on the paid amounts, we are missing that coinsurance and copay on the Medicare side. Uh, because of those differences, um, we calculated uh, an allowed amount version of the Medicare fee-for-service benchmark. So if you are familiar with the ACO benchmark numbers from other reports, keep in mind that our numbers may look different compared to what you are seeing in other reports. Um, the other point of difference was the on the Medicare side, um, there is a prospective benchmark set, but at the end there is a resettlement and th that benchmark is recalculated based on the performance of that year. On the Medicaid, as you all know, it's a prospective uh, per month per member uh, rate that the Medicaid pays prospectively. Um, again, uh, because of those differences, we adjusted our benchmark numbers, uh, so we are looking at the what I would call the at the end settlement rate um, that takes into account all those adjustments that happens throughout the year. So again, we are looking at apples to apples comparisons when we look at the benchmark rate. Finally, um, this was a simple math. Um, you know, some benchmarks are published as the per member per year versus per member per month. Um, so for simplicity, we converted them all to a per, per member per month rate, so our, our numbers are looking similar to each other as you are going to see in, in the next slides. Uh, the third step that we needed to do is um, to consolidate some of the rates that were in non-Medicare payers. Uh, on the Medicare fee-for-service, uh, we have a single uh, ACO benchmark that we are using for non-ESRD patients and and stage renal disease patients. So that's the uh, most uh, aged Medicare beneficiaries. Um, for Medicaid, 
uh, we have three rates. We have an adult rate, we have a children and an ABD, age disabled and blind rate. So we needed to come up with a methodology to combine all these different rates into a single number so we can compare it with Medicare adult rate. Uh, for this math, um, what we decided to do is we created a weighted average of these three rates because if you think about the way the Medicare is constructed, it is the uh, population of all the elderly uh, that gets into that rate development. Similarly, for Medicaid, um, we aggregated these three rates using the population numbers uh, that are provided to us uh, to come up with a single Medicaid ACO benchmark, which is weighted by the population distributions for these three groups. On the commercial side, uh, we do have different contracts for each commercial payer. Uh, and it didn't make sense for us to weight them based on the attributed lives for each commercial plan. So for commercial plan, what we are looking at is a straight average for the commercial rate as we compare the commercial benchmark to the Medicare fee-for-service. Uh, finally, a big um, work that needed to happen was to think about the covered services and additional adjustments that we needed to make. Um, so I already mentioned the uh, patient cost sharing uh, that was part of the Medicare and Medicaid comparisons that we needed to do. In addition, Zach there are some channel. additional payments Zach that are included in the contracts, like administrative fees, additional fees for coordination. Um, so we made um, some adjustments to the additional fees to make sure that the the, the benchmarks exclude those additional fees uh, that were only specific to a special um, contract uh, for Medicaid or commercial payers. Uh, so they are all, again, on the same um, med you know, medical expenses um, benchmark uh, targets. Um, in addition, uh, there were some adjustments that we weren't uh, able to do, uh, which is the specific coverage that the commercial plans have that would be different from the Medicare covered services. In general, our assessment of the ACO contracts is that the covered services are very similar. Um, the additional coverage that was in the commercial plans uh, were removed if it was a big significant amount, uh, but the detail coverage and um, some of the requirements around inpatient services, outpatient services, obviously um, wasn't part of the detail that we were able to get, so there are still some design differences that are still um, in, in these numbers. On the Medicaid side, as you all know, the Medicaid contract is also uh, based on Medicare co uh, covered services for hospital and physician services. Uh, Medicaid excludes long-term care, which is going to be a big one. And um, as we're thinking about the options, I will take that back again to consider the implications of the services uh, not covered by ACO contract, but provided by Medicaid or commercial payers. Finally, um, as we are looking at the comparisons, um, the, the, what we call a health status risk adjustment is an important factor. Um, the utilization rates will depend on whether the patient population is sicker or healthier. And to control for those differences across three payers, uh, we chose a single common risk adjustment methodology for all payers. Um, this is a, a a methodology developed by the Johns Hopkins uh, group called ACGs, Adjusted Clinical Group, uh, widely used by uh, many payers, including Medicaid. Um, so we used this algorithm and calculated the scores for entire population in the ACO attributed lives in our all payer claims database. Um, but because it still has some limitations, we excluded end stage renal disease population from Medicare because that population is a a uh, very high utilizer, high risk patient, and we didn't feel comfortable to have them in the calculations as we we're looking at the average ACO benchmarks. The risk scores um, are calibrated to predict future cost. Um, so they are prospective in the sense. So what we are trying to estimate with the scoring is uh, their healthcare costs in 2018, looking at their historical costs in 2017. 
so with that, we calculate an expected score that would adjust for any cost variations due to their disease burden. We used a, a nine month continuous enrollment, so we have enough data uh, from the claims for us to be calculate a reasonable risk score. And as I mentioned, um, our data source for risk scores is the APCD, we cures um, medical claims. We did not use the pharmacy claims, uh, which uh, did not um, have it significant impact based on our literature review on the risk scoring. And finally, as we looked at the 2018, we did not make any exclusions for the ACO enrollment. So if the ACO aligned members dropped coverage during the year, it is part of the calculations that we have uh, in 2018 estimates. Am I going too fast? Should I slow down a little bit? Just a hair. Okay, I tend to speak quite fast, so I'm I'm doing my best. I will. So uh, maybe before I get to the results, let me summarize what we did. Right. So we take the ACO benchmarks, we adjusted it for differences in clinical services, and then on the population, we adjusted for health status differences between Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial plans. So that's kind of at a high level two significant adjustments that we needed to make. Once we adjust for the um, risk scores, uh, we didn't find everybody in the data set, right? Because we are looking at the 2017 claims. And in this table, you are seeing our verification results to verify that in our analyses, we have the majority of the ACO aligned beneficiaries in our analysis. So in the first column, what you are seeing is the uh, the count of member months that we included in the payer differential report. Um, so it's about the million uh, member months uh, that are aligned with the ACO. Um, and when you look at the VQs, uh, when we have those ACO alignment um, at the claim level, you see that the, those numbers are slightly higher. So we lost about 2% of the ACO aligned beneficiaries because we didn't find historical claims for us to calculate their risk score. And you'll see that in general for Medicare and Medicaid, uh, those numbers are quite small, but you do see for commercial that the loss, the percent lost in this analysis is about 5% of the commercial ACO aligned beneficiaries. So instead of uh, 283 uh, member months, we were able to uh, base our estimates on 267. Talking with the commercial payers and the um, other folks who are familiar with the attribution, we, we think that this is a result of um, changes in the commercial plan coverage in 2017 and the way that they attribute the members. Um, still, relatively speaking, uh, that number is quite small, so we felt confident to move forward and look at the commercial ACO benchmark results um, with the statistics in mind. Then the second validation, we looked at the risk scores. Um, again, risk scores are meant to adjust for expected healthcare cost because of the health status. And as you expect, um, you would see that the Medicare risk score should be higher um, given the disease burden uh, for the Medicare population compared to Medicaid and commercial. Overall, in general, uh, what you have is the first column is the ACO aligned members. So when you aggregate all the ACO aligned members, what we are seeing is that the ACO aligned population is 2% um, less healthy than the general population in VCure. So ACO has um, uh, somewhat high risk patients in their um, attributed lives at 2%. When you look at Medicare, uh, the Medicare is 48% higher overall. And here we verified it by looking at Medicare only and dual eligibles. And you'll see that the dual eligible score is 90% higher than the state average. And this is again, reflection of the high disease burden on dual eligible uh, Medicare fee for service beneficiaries. Um, and for the Medicare only, again, what you are seeing is a 42% uh, compared to our state average um, in the health score. Moving on to Medicaid, um, Medicaid um, ACO attributed lives are healthier than our average 
in the state. Um, so it's 0.84, converting to a percent, it's 16% lower than average health score in the view cures. Again, here you do see an expected variation with adult population to be sicker, 20%. The children being very healthy at 39, a point 39 health score average, and then the ABD, which is the adult um, age blind and disabled, you see that their disease burden in it is uh, twice as much as an average risk in our VQRS population for the state average. Going to commercial, um, commercial has a healthier population and their score is at 0.72. So all these findings. Uh, was in line with our understanding of the populations um, and the way that the attribution algorithms worked. Um, so after this veri verification, we went to adjusting the ACO benchmarks uh, using these health risk scores to come up with a comparison report. In the results, um, so in this table, what you have is the um, our statistics to calculate the risk adjusted benchmark rate, which is on the third, uh, fourth column. Uh, you'll see the member months that we included as a reference and the average uh, rescaled risk scores that are in the previous slide. Um, so using these two um, statistics, uh, what we have is the ACO benchmark rate, um, and that's adjusted using the average risk score uh, to come up with a comparable uh, risk-adjusted benchmark rate for payer differential. So if you follow the Medicare fee-for-service as an example, their ACO benchmark rate is 806 per member per month. When we adjust for the disease burden, which is 48%, you'll see that the risk-adjusted benchmark score is now at 645, right? You reduced it because uh, of the disease burden for the Medicare uh, fee-for-service population. And similarly, when you look at Medicaid, Medicaid benchmark went up because they have a healthier population. And for commercial, um, their benchmark also went up because of the healthier population that they have in the ACA-aligned um, uh, member months. Once we compare those numbers, what you see is what we call the peer differential ratios. So compared to Medicare, Medicaid has uh, 0.45, again converting to a percent. Medicaid ACO benchmark is 55% lower than the Medicare fee-for-service benchmark. And conversely, the commercial average is 5% higher than the Medicare fee-for-service benchmark. So this is our final result for looking at the peer differential, again, focusing on the ACO benchmarks only. We also did some subgroup analysis, um, and here um, you see that the impact of different uh, beneficiary groups. I am not going to go into detail, but in this slide, um, you could see that the uh, the Medicare only population is uh, five percent higher than the uh, Medicare average. And what you are seeing on the Medicaid side is that they are similar to each other because Medicaid is setting the ACO benchmarks for these individual groups separately. So they, they take into account the risk factors for these three groups and their ACO benchmarks are adjusted for those separately compared to a Medicare where Medicare is using a single average for both Medicare only and dual eligible population. Um, so, after the results, we did some additional analyses, and I'm going to talk about the limitations of the, uh, the numbers that we calculated. Um, the, the ask and the scope of the report was, once we calculate the payer differential, um, the consideration was, how is this impacting the ACO and ACO financial benchmarks? Um, so, the question here is, as we calculate these differences, is that something about the way the Medicaid set ACO benchmarks that explains that difference? Or is there something else uh, that is explaining that 55% difference that we are seeing in the benchmark analysis? And the second one is uh, because the healthcare cost differs by geographies, are there other factors that we need to take into account? Um, it could be low cost areas, it could be socioeconomic factors uh, that may also explain the differences that we are seeing between the ACO benchmark for Medicaid versus um, the Medicare or on the commercial benchmark. So I will share with you um, 
two analyses on these two topics. Um, the first one is the question around how the ACO benchmark is calculated. Here, um, we looked at the 2018 cost and, and, and tried to test whether these benchmarks were similar to the expected cost given the fee-for-service schedule that the Medicaid has or commercial payers have um, so that we can we can have some assessment on whether the differentials that we are seeing in the benchmarks are a result of the way the benchmarks are set or is it coming from something else such as a fee-for-service or the claim um, historical cost that we have in, in the uh, benchmarking methodology. So this is um, somewhat a complicated view. Um, I would like to phrase this next table in this context that this was a, a data point for us to take a look at. Um, uh, definitely uh, the use of this data is limited because when you look at the cost in 2018, there are multiple factors impacting 2018 cost estimates, right? The, the big one is the ACO performance. If ACO uh, manage these populations differently and their expected cost in 2018 is different than the ACO benchmark, we haven't taken into account those type of factors in this analysis. Um, secondly, we didn't take into account any of the membership changes during the year uh, that may bias this analysis, um, as well as some of the additional impact on the cost, um, for example, the mortality um, and the percent changes in the dual eligible, et cetera, that is not part of the uh, analysis. So what we wanted to do is let's take a look at what the 2018 cost look like and evaluate the benchmarks from the cost perspective. And here by cost, I mean the claim-based cost. So this is, if they were not in ACO, what would be the PMPM payment amounts for the aligned population, right? So with those caveats, um, what you have in this table is the risk-adjusted PMPM costs. So these are the claim-based um, calculations that we did for 2018 in the first column. And the next is the risk-adjusted benchmark. So we expect that those two would be related to each other. If they are not, then we could conclude that the differences that we are seeing in the Medicaid uh, and commercial ACO benchmarks are related to something that they are doing in the ACO benchmark uh, methodologies. Here, um, the important numbers are in the last column, the cost to benchmark ratios. And what you are seeing is a 1% to 2% differences between the claim-based cost versus the benchmark, which uh, made us to conclude that the differences that we calculated as payer differential is a function of the fee-for-service um, claims and the payment differences. It is not a function of the way the payers set their benchmarks differentially. So this is kind of an important um, and, and difficult concept. So I'll be happy to answer the questions after the presentation if you have any. The next table, uh, we looked at the geographies. Um, here, the hypothesis is that if certain payers have more attributed patients, uh, members in certain geographies, would that bias the statistic that we are calculating in the ACO benchmarking? And um, in this table, what we are presenting is the similar cost to benchmark ratios by the hospital service areas. So in Burlington, uh, that ratio is 0.92 for Medicaid and 0.94 for Medicare. And in this case, if Medicaid percent ACO members is 24. If that was higher, that would reduce the cost to benchmark ratios for Medicaid. In this case, what you are seeing is for Medicaid is 24% of the attributed lives versus 42% for Medicare. Um, so it didn't have much of an impact on the differential that we were calculating. We did do a additional analysis, take into account this variation across the different hospital service areas, and our conclusions around payer differential did not change. Um, in other words, um, the 55% differential we're calculating for Medicaid is not coming from any geographic uh, distributional differences in the Medicaid uh, population versus Medicare fee-for-service. 
After those two initial analyses, um, the we wanted to outline the limitations to put these numbers into context. Um, ACG risk scores are commonly used in a valid healthcare uh, utilization measures, health status measures, but they still do not take into account all the variations. So we might be still uh, having some measurement uh, limitations around health status, or we didn't add additional um, factors um, such as mental health. Um, ACG is supposed to take all most of it, but there might be additional factors that we may consider um, in, in the future. Um, the second one is um, we didn't examine differences in um, service sites, um, so you could consider some of this variation coming from uh, heavy utilization in expensive services such as hospital-based outpatient clinics versus um, more physician-based clinics. So that might be a factor explaining um, the benchmark analyses that we did on payer differential. And um, thirdly, as I mentioned, apples to apples comparisons are limited because of the way the plan designs are working uh, for each commercial payers as well as Medicaid and Medicare. And, and finally, uh, as we are thinking about the payer differential, um, we really took a very uh, limited view for the payer differential, and we did not consider some of the variations coming from the attribution methodologies um, and, and some of the additional funding the Medicaid is providing for high-cost services such as long-term care. All right, so this was the assessment report when we looked at the differences between payers in their actual ACO benchmark. How did the benchmarks change over time is our second question. Um, here we are looking at the growth rate in the benchmarks. Um, the same risk adjustment is applied. Um, and here we have two growth rates. One is just actual benchmark growth rate. Um, so we're looking at what did they set in 2018, what did they set in 2019, and looking at that change uh, over time. Um, the second one is we calculated what mm -hmm. we term update factor. Um, this is looking at the change in attributed live costs. So in the first one, because the attribution change, network change over time, the statistic um, that change uh, in the annual growth rate has a function of changes in network and changes in population, as well as change in, in the financial um, expectations from each payer, right? So it does have a limited view into how actually the payment amounts are changing over time. So to get gauge on that payment amount question, we also calculated the what we call update factor. In this case, it's the same attributed population looking at their base year estimated cost versus what the ACO benchmarks are. So the first one is year over year, just the ACO benchmark uh, change here. You do see a drop in the ACO benchmark rates. Um, uh, but the drops are similar um, in, in both payers, uh, and we weren't able to uh, calculate the commercial payers uh, because of the lack of data uh, for from multiple commercial payers. Um, so in this case, uh, looking at the 2018 to 2019 on a weighted basis, Medicaid ACO benchmark dropped by 2.4%, and on the Medicare, it, it is dropped by uh, 2%. So they are very similar. Um, when we factor into the changes in network and attributed beneficiaries, um, I believe this is the more relevant data to consider. Um, so when we look at the 2018, when the payers set the 2018 benchmarks compared to the total cost in the baselines, Medicaid benchmark was 5% higher than the estimated cost. And for Medicare, it was 3.5%. When we look at the 2019, the similar number is now at 2.2%. And um, I believe there were some work done on the Medicaid, increasing fee for service payments for Medicaid, that may factor into that 5% growth rate for Medicaid, as well as some additional uh, administrative fees, other funding that may have been in the 2018 numbers. Uh, with 2019, we do see the alignment uh, between Medicaid and Medicare around the 2.2%, um, what we call the update factor. All right, um, so now we looked at the assessment, we looked at the growth rates, um, and now finally where we are um, with the payer differential and the options. 
so for this report, again, we focused on the ACO benchmarks, uh, but we wanted to think a little bit broadly what this differential mean. Um, and uh, we did not analyze additional things, but you're going to see some ideas around to take this work further as you're thinking about the peer differential um, and, and what the next steps are to reduce that differential. Um, here, um, we discussed the options with um, the um, GMCB staff, DIVA, and the commercial payers uh, to get their feedback um, and um, come up with a three options that um, was included in the report. Um, so the first one is um, thinking, thinking about the broader um, aspects of the ACOs um, and, and factoring into the changes in the attributed lives. Um, and, and really, um, if the differential is considered both in terms of the benchmark and the impact on the population, how many people are enrolled, how many people's care is coordinated would be an important factor uh, to consider. So that's the number one, shifting the focus to the scale target uh, conversations. Number two is thinking about the benchmark. Uh, our analyses concluded that the differential that we have seen is coming from the fee-for-service base uh, claim payments. Um, the option could be to think about the benchmark calculations differently as you are preparing for the second phase of the model um, and evaluate different alternatives for constructing benchmarks across different payers. And, and third, um, uh, there is an interest in the policy um, to look at the peer differential in a wider context. So ACO was uh, the significant portion, uh, but could we look at additional analyses to look at um, cost shifting or, or other benefits that are covered by the uh, Medicaid and Medicare and assess the peer differential uh, from the full benefit uh, perspective? Um, so this slide is providing you with a summary of the uh, scale targets. So the scale targets measure the percent of ACO aligned beneficiaries. Um, in this case, uh, you have in the dotted lines are the scale targets established by the uh, agreement. Um, so the top one is the all payer um, uh, tar sorry, the uh, Medicare target, the red one, um, and the below is the all payer target in the yellow one. As we look at the 2019 and 2020, um, what you are seeing is in the green line, you see the progress the Medicaid has made in 2019 by changing their algorithm and um, including geographic attribution in, in their um, ACO contract. With that, the uh, reach of the ACO program to the Medicaid members, eligible members, is exceeding 50%. When you look at the all payer, uh, we are way below the 50% target in the in the yellow lines. Uh, the Medicare fee for service is close to 50 in 2019, but you do see a drop in the 2020. And when we prepared this uh, table, we did not have the numbers from the uh, Medicaid, uh, and we will be updating this with the Medicaid numbers um, in, in in the future. And as we are looking at the commercial, uh, commercial payment rates were similar to Medicare, but you do see the limited reach to the commercial population averaging around 10% of the commercial members in the state with ACO alignment. Um, the other way to think about the stale target is, and the payer differential is, how is this impacting the provider participation? Um, so we we outlined um, some ideas around to look at um, if there are differential pay provider participation in the ACO and concentrating on Medicaid uh, dominant providers or Medicaid specific providers and evaluating um, the proportion of those providers um, in the ACO network as additional information to understand the implications for the uh, payer differential. The second option, which is um, somewhat uh, more major change for you to consider um, in terms of the phase two development for the ACO program is to rethink about alternative payment models. So here I, I term the alternative payment under the shadow of historical fee for service cost claim cost estimates. If you think about the ACO benchmarks, right, we use the historical fee for service 
um, that includes the payment rates as well as utilization estimates from the fee for service legacies. And then we estimate the expected growth. We could put efficiency estimates, we could put um, expected growth because of the medical inflation. But at the end of the day, we tie ourselves to the historical fee for service um, legacies. As you are thinking from the payer differential perspective, there might be alternative approaches to think about this uh, population-based payment method where it is truly about estimating the cost of efficient, high-quality care um, that is on a PMPM prospective basis that has those incentives that you are uh, installing in the system but on the financial side, creating those uh, cost-based estimates where the payer differential would narrow um, as a lot of this is coming from the traditional fee-for-service uh, payment uh, mechanisms. And finally, um, the last option is um, to consider the payer differential in the larger context. Um, here, graphically, uh, we try to put a visual to show you the limitations that I mentioned earlier as we are looking at the ACO benchmarks. Um, because it's centered around the Medicare um, covered services, it does include significant portion of the Medicare covered services, part A for hospital services, part B for the physician. It doesn't include the pharmacy part D, uh, which is covered by Medicare, but not part of the ACO. And uh, as you all know, Medicare doesn't cover any long-term care services, so that's at zero. When you look at the Medicaid, um, this is totally illustration, uh, but an assessment of how much of this payment and services covered by ACO versus not covered by ACO and incorporating those long-term care services, mental health, et cetera, into the equation might give you a better sense of where we are in terms of the payer differential. In addition, um, there might be questions around um, the source of this payer differential and thinking about the cost shifting. Um, here, you could think about looking at the fee, for, fee schedule differences and utilization differences to unpack um, the understanding around payer differential. A site of service, I mentioned before, I believe could be an important factor um, to analyze in addition to the overall PMPM estimates. Um, and um, as we think about this from a wider policy perspective, um, do we need to think about some cost estimates for providing services, which will be looking at the cost of providing services, not there, the payment side, but the salary supplies, et cetera, to estimate the cost of providing services um, and looking at the payer differential from cost versus payment uh, con uh, continuum and looking at what percent of the cost is covered by Medicaid, Medicare, or commercial payment rates. So those are ideas um, in terms of taking the analysis to the next level to help you to think about the options for reducing payer differential um, that we calculated on the ACO benchmarks. So that ends my slide deck. Um, I appreciate the time and I know this is a lot, but I hope this gave you uh, the overall picture, which is more comprehensive than a single report. Um, so with that, I think we could open to questions. Super, thank you. We're going to go in alphabetical order and we'll start with Robin. Okay, I'm not sure how that's alphabetical order, but it's fine with oh, me. Oh, Jessica, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you, Shuley. I appreciate it and all the hard work here. I know that it's a very complicated analysis and uh, I appreciate all the, the complexity and also your presentation. Um, you know, the, what struck me at the end was your um, point about maybe shifting to a population based payment system that's you know based on the cost of the of delivering efficient care and you talked about you know estimating the true cost of providing service and i'm wondering how how do you go about doing that what would be the first step at really truly understanding that the true cost of delivering a service not linked to what the fee for service payment system says it is but the actual cost of the supplies the salaries the equipment whatever that might be uh, you know, I attended a couple, I think a couple of years ago, there was a health affairs um, national meeting around healthcare costs. You know, they do annual analysis of the, the cost nationwide. And 
I remember one of the renowned health economists said, we don't know what the cost of healthcare is. And I, I think it is a difficult question, but I do think there are places where we could start, you know, the hospital, like facilities have cost reporting. I know it is hard to analyze, but there are places where we could start turning that conversation and really think as a CFO of these organizations, right? So they do have estimates on what it takes to run an office, right? How many staff that they need to have. Um, there is not a good uniform data set like APCD, but there are places where these costs are estimated and calculated on the provider side. And as the board, you may have some initial analyses on the hospital side, on, on, on the physician side to get a average estimates um, at the high level to start picking on that cost question. But how do you, I mean, any inefficiencies in the delivery of care will be baked into those cost estimates. Right. So, how do you start to unpack what is what is a cost-effective uh, price? I'm using too many terms here, but you know, how do we ascertain that this particular cost is efficient? However, it's calculated through the cost reports or whatnot. I mean, how do we start to then say this is this is the true this is what the cost should be of delivering that particular service? A hospital may be delivering it at above or maybe below. But how do we start to say this is a reasonable cost to deliver a particular healthcare service without using embedded costs already in the system? Right. So I mentioned first you need to have the cost information. Then your question is then how do you know whether it's an efficient cost or not? Right. And there, um, two things. One is from the organizational behavior side, you could do management type of analysis to estimate, which which is going to be very narrow, but at least will give you some sense. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, in, in efficiency calculations, usually you look at the variation, right? Um, so you do get a sense of the variation across different providers and and have some assessment of there will be outliers. So you may not find the efficient one, you'll find the outliers in, in type of variation analyses, and that would help you to think about what your efficiency is. Um, you know, are there, there benchmarks are, that people have used for this kind of analysis that you're aware of? Um, not established, <laughs> no, uh, the, the short answer is no, but there are some work that is happening in other states um, in Maryland and, and some other places where it is happening. What I've seen is you, you are probably familiar with the Medicare reference pricing, right? So without doing the cost analysis, a lot of work right now is happening around just benchmarking against the Medicare fee for service and see what the variation look like. Again, it is not getting into the efficiency, but it is giving you that benchmark uh, that is applicable to multiple payers. Okay. Thank you. And thanks for the presentation and all this hard work. Thank you. Okay, now we'll go to Robin. Thank you. <laughs> uh, um, yes, thank you, Shule. It was a great presentation, and uh, the report also was very comprehensive and thorough, and so we really appreciate your work on this. Um, kind of following up from where Jessica was headed, um, I was curious, this issue around um, rate setting comes up in a broader context for us from time to time in terms of differentials in the fee-for-service area. Um, and so I can see how you could use the Medicare cost reports in a facility uh, for hospitals, for example, um, and that you, there are probably similar types of reports for FQHCs or other entities. But how do you tackle it with independent providers where, quite frankly, we don't have any data? It seems like if we wanted to really tackle that, we need to start collecting something similar to a cost report from those providers. Am I off base there? Or you I'm, I'm totally like throwing this in your direction without any prep. So feel free to say <laughs> you don't want to comment. But I was just curious about that. Um, I, I think there probably the approach is to be targeted and find good examples of type of providers that you want to look deep. Um, 
and you know there is the technology piece to it right so if you are an independent provider i think there are significant cost items that you can get your head around but not a comprehensive analysis of you know old independent providers um you know i i think it, it, what we call more of a qualitative approach where it's more case studies to understand the main cost drivers and assessing whether that's a typical provider or is is it a very you know unique provider that you want to take into account um but I, I i think the other thing on the rate setting robin to think about is like we are moving on to a pm pm type like comprehensive Absolutely. approaches yeah. And where does that leave us to estimating this cost on a still on a unit base, right? So that that is another consideration that you need to think about. Like do you, the analogy is on the on the car, right? So we are kind of trying to put the car speed dials and everything else. Do you really care what is under the hood? Yeah. So that's the other place of thinking about what level of cost analysis that you want to do to get a sense of what that. Um, benchmarking would look like on a PMPM PM basis. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, and that was really my only question, but thank you for your presentation and the, and the options. Thank you, Robin. Tom? <clears throat> Making sure I'm not on mute. Um, so there was a lot there, and uh, you know, I'm just wondering as obviously you know, I'm in no position to replicate the analysis, you know, from a, you know, technical mathematical point of view, but I'm just wondering that there were so many adjustments um, uh, in the calculation process as to whether or not there's a margin of error around the results. That each one of those adjustments must have a margin of error and cumulatively they compound each other to some extent, maybe, as you go through the analysis. And I'm just wondering if the, if if there's any significance to that. Great question. Another great question, Tom. Um, definitely, there is a margin of error. If if you think about the approach apples to apples comparison, right? We did our best to get to apples to apples, but we were limited because of the way the plans are designed. Um, so, for example, the, the commercial average is 5% higher than the Medicare. With the margin of error, you know, it could be similar to a Medicare. So, I, I think there, the difference that we found could be explained by that margin of error that you mentioned. On the Medicaid side, the number is big, 55%, right? If you think about just the ACO benchmark, and then the margin of error around ACO benchmark is not going to make up for that difference. So there is, right, so the 55%, you could kind of throw some estimates, but at the end, that, that difference is going to stay significant no matter what the margin of error is, given all the adjustments that we made. The, the challenge with the Medicaid number is we know Medicaid is covering more than what we measured. And how do you think about that as you're thinking about the payer differential? And that's more of a policy question in addition to estimating that number, right? That number by design wasn't part of the payer differential because we're looking at ACO only. But from your perspective, from the policy maker perspective, you do want to know that number as well. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> So this this is just a I mean I know that this is just a a one year window uh, 2018 relative to 2019 but um, during that time uh, this may be more of a macro question the Medicaid uh, caseload actually dropped in Vermont um, and the Medicare caseload I think increased because of an aging population and I'm just wondering if that kind of differential uh trend um even on a one-year basis um has that has any significance to the analysis uh at a high level you're talking about the annual changes right um at a high level we took account the changes in the risk so if we had more you know uh healthier population joining medicare roles and leaving Medicaid, risk adjustment took into account that. So uh, I, I think we are controlling for the changes in the alignment um, and the roles 
Um, what we are not controlling, however, is if there was a differentially pent up demand. So if you know for the Medicare, if you if you if if more people joined Medicare in 2019 and they were waiting for certain services to get it from Medicare, uh, you know that is not controlled as part of the whole whole health status adjustments, right? So there might be some potential impact of that dynamic in the 2019 numbers. Sorry, I just turned my camera on. I thought I was worried about my muting and I forgot to uh, uh, put my camera on. Just a couple more questions here. Wouldn't over time, I mean, this is a very narrow window of analysis, but over time, um, if the ACO model is effective um, in terms, wouldn't you see, begin to see a divergence in terms of of the actual experience that's occurring versus the benchmark, which is based on still the rear view mirror of, of, of the uh, you know, claims that are in the, in the rear view mirror. So wouldn't over time you expect this gap um, to, to be growing and which would be evidence that the uh, ACO model is working and becoming more efficient and, and effective? Very good question, um, and I'm happy that you took that table, the cost, the benchmark ratios, exactly the way that I, I hoped you would. Those differentials should grow over time as ACO becomes more effective. What we calculate from the fee-for-service claims should be lower than the ACO benchmarks, and differentially, it should be uh, different for Medicare and Medicaid. If you think about the population needs, you know, we haven't talked a lot about um, what we call avoidable utilization, right? If you improve care coordination, you know, patients are, you know, going to use less ED, less inpatient. And when you look at the estimates, there is more on the Medicare population because of their health status compared to Medicaid. Um, so that differential should increase much more on the Medicare side than the Medicaid or the commercial side. Um, one last one is um, uh, all, assuming all things being equal in your analysis, um, except one one variable, and that variable is that Medicaid um, did not increase any of its reimbursement rates uh, during 2019. Um, and I ask that because uh, Medicaid, the, the the Medicaid budget. Um, um, for 2021 was presented to the legislature and adopted by the legislature with no rate increases except for those that are federally mandated in Medicaid reimbursement rates. So I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of if that were true in the period of this analysis, that there were no Medicaid uh, rate increases, how would that show up in the analysis, if at all? So. Help, sorry, can you help me understand the timeline? So we looked at the 2018 for a differential. Are you referring to 2019 or 2020? Oh, well, I'm, I'm I'm taking a real real world experience mm -hmm. for um 20 the 2021 budget. Okay. Uh, um, and uh, we were told, and uh, the legislature was told, and they adopted that there would be no reimbursement increases in the 2021 20, budget over the 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I'm thinking if in, I'm just wondering uh, how that might show up if in 2019, there were no Medicaid rate increases uh, relative to the uh, 2018 profile. Uh, so, I guess in terms of the, Pair differential, you need to look at what the ACO rates are changing, the what we call update factor. We do see an increase there. And it could be not the rate increase, but the utilization factor, right? So they may not change their fees, fee schedules, but how much growth that is going to be in the ACO benchmark compared to the estimated cost. So you do want to look at that to 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 see if there is going to be an impact on the differential. Mm -hmm. um, the 
being everything equal, let's say everything is equal and they're going to reflect that to the ACO benchmarking, right? So no increases for ACO benchmarks. Um, then I think then you would look at the Medicare increases and I don't know the detail well enough, but on the Medicare world, you know, there is a 2% uh, adjustment factor for all IPPS inpatient outpatient hospital services, right? So Medicare fees grew. I don't know what the ACO benchmark is going to be for the Medicare. Um, so I, I think at this point, you want to think about the ACO benchmark rate increases um, that may come in front of you and evaluate it from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, well, what, just one last question floating around in my mind that wouldn't um, going looking forward option two in terms of your uh, option recommendations, the one that uh, talks about uncoupling the benchmark uh, from fee for service, wouldn't be that where we would want to be going anyhow, um, just because that's the whole point to a great extent of what the ACO is there uh, to do is to decouple from the past. And so if we're always looking forward based on the past, um, then that uh, those benchmarks might not be uh, helping us get, you know, if they're based on the past, helping us get to where we want to go from a policy point of view. But thank, th thank you very much. This is a uh, <laughs> it was pretty I, pretty dense. <laughs> pretty dense. I, I, I did my best. I apologize. I wish we had like one report per meeting so that way you can delve into the detail. Yeah. Um, for your last comment, you know, Vermont has been trailblazer in multiple places. You are the only state who is doing all peer ACO, right? And if, if you can crack that knot and figure out how to set the benchmarks uh, outside, outside of the paper service legacy, uh, you are going to help not only your your state, but everyone else who is watching Vermont um, on the alternative payment models. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Maureen. Uh, well, thank you very much for the thorough presentation. Um, I think going near the end, I actually don't have any more questions, but it was very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Maureen. At this point, I'm going to open it up for public comment. Is there any member of the public who wishes to comment at this time? And I see that Rick Dooley has his hand raised. Rick? I do. Thank you so much. Um, I'm always struck by these presentations um, about the complexity of everything involving healthcare in general, but certainly the benchmark setting in the ACO. It's, it's astounding to me. Um, I just wanted to, I appreciate uh, both Jessica and Robin bringing up the, um, you know, sort of the idea of the of the site differences. I know that was in your presentation as well, and how complex it is to um, sort of determine the difference in cost between it with independent providers in the mix. Um, and I don't think there's any easy answers, but I was intrigued and we've kind of circled around this and, you know, we've talked to Green Mountain Care Board numerous times and we, we always come back to the same thing, which is that there's this sort of, you know, gap in data um from the independents because they're all so unique um that there's not like a representative practice but i'm intrigued by this by this idea of having you know maybe a you know sort of a template that you can provide to a sampling a statistically significant sampling of practice across the state to get at some of the you know some of the data that we've been trying to get at for a long time i also wonder how much can you extrapolate based on just reimbursement rates? You know, now that the um, hospital's reimbursement rates, you know, become public after the first of the year, you know, we, we have a sort of a marker. How much can you extrapolate? Because presumably if you look at the reimbursement rate for an independent practice and there's still a float with that, and you look at the reimbursement rate for the hospital, I know there's always some cost shifting, there's still a float with that. How closely would that match to, to cost of providing service, do you think? Does that make sense? It does. I, I guess, uh, you know, the, the first one, complexity, I agree with you. Um, and um, the, the, the reimbursement, I, I would be very careful using the reimbursement rates because at the end of the day, it's great improvement that we are going to have more data transparency. Um, but in terms of making sense of that data um, is going to be a challenge. Um, one is like, yeah, you could compare a, a, a price of a test, right? That's, that's, 
that's comparable across no matter whether you are a Medicaid patient or not. But once you are in an institution in patient care and they are providing you the service, the level of effort, right, the complexity is not going to be easily seen by looking at the reimbursement rates, right? Um, so that that's where it's going to get very complicated in my view. Um, to understand the, the payer differential just by looking at the reimbursement rates. So I would be very careful in kind of teasing out that a little bit. Um, on the on the provider side too, you know, independence, right? It's it's their salary. Like I, I think I agree with you. There might be a, a good way to get a sense of the cost for the independent uh, providers um, if they're office-based. Um, but again, there are so many things to think about. So I would take very comprehensive approach initially to make sure that you get what you get. Like for example, in this analysis, we were constrained to look at ACO benchmarks, right? We didn't look at the site of services by design because we didn't set up our systems and analysis to look at the site of service. So we just found one initial analysis, now it's the next stage. So being nimble and thinking through the analysis would help to get to a, a, a kind of a good analysis and good numbers that you can use. And I think part of the strength of the GMCB is to data-driven approach, right? So you do want the data to be able to make a, a rational and sensible decisions moving forward. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Other members of the public, any public comment? Well, seeing none, Shuli, I want to thank you. Uh, I always learn a lot whenever you uh, um, spend some time with us, and uh, today is no different. It's a lot to uh, um, really uh, decompress and try to figure this all out. So um, I'm glad you slowed down a little bit. I was struggling <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> I'll be happy to come back next month uh, if if that's what you'd like and kind of do another one at a high level. But yeah, I think it's a challenge to explain the complexity and have you get with the take homes, right? Um, so. I, I hope at least you understand, you know, I, my goal was to get you understand 60 to 80 percent. So hopefully we are somewhere around that range. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you and your team. And uh, um, with that, is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. No move. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show it was unanimous. And again, thank you everyone. And uh, um, Michelle, you'll have to give me the uh, version for dummies. <laughs> We'll work on that together. Yeah, I'll do my best. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Bye. Have a good day. Bye.